Great. Fantastic. I suppose we'll wait another few, uh, another minute or so here for people to pile over. Hi, Steve. This is Dale. Can you hear me? Hello, Dale. Yes, I can hear you. You're a little bit muffled, but I can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, good. Um, I'm going to be on mute here, but good luck. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, just Thank you for inviting me. This is a great a minute, honor and a pleasure in. to be here. All right. Thank you. Okay. I, I suppose we'll get started. Um, my name is Steve Potter. Uh, I prefer to go by Steve M. Potter because there's a million Steve Potters out there. Uh, there's fewer Steve M. Potters. I am an adjunct associate professor at Georgia Tech in the Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering, which is kind of a strange department because it's shared between Georgia Tech and Emory University. So two schools across Atlanta both share one department. I had my research lab at Georgia Tech in the Laboratory for Neuroengineering. I call myself a neuroengineer and a neuroscientist. However, since uh, 2015 or so, 2016, I guess, uh, I closed up my research lab and became a freelance maker because before that I had spent two years as a um, on sabbatical exploring the maker movement. So I got to meet Dale Doherty and I got to uh, go to many maker fairs and after a while realized that doing making full time is what I really enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed doing scientific research and running a, a big lab, but finding the funding was always a st struggle. I also really enjoyed teaching and uh, I continue to do that here in Ireland where I teach hands-on workshops for makers in uh, things like CNC carving and electronics and programming and whatnot. So, um, so I'm basically uh, doing all of the things that I absolutely love doing nowadays. So let's see if I can move on with my talk here. The, the basic idea of this whole talk is that project-based learning really motivates students. And um, I'm going to show you some examples of visible and enduring projects from two of the courses that I taught at Georgia Tech. And I will present some student testimonials about my real world curriculum. And I'll give you some ideas about how you can make your courses more real and therefore more highly motivating. So this is all based on my new book called How to Motivate Your Students to Love Learning, in which I give a lot of specific advice for teachers at all levels. And I mix it with my own personal story. Um, although most of my teaching has been at the uh, higher education level, I think that the ideas that I'm going to be talking about and which I talk about at length in the book are applicable to people, learners of all ages, whether they're kindergartners or even retired people. I teach sometimes retired people in my workshop, uh, people much older than me who don't even know how to use a computer mouse. I have taught to learn how to do CAD and design something on the CNC machine. So, um, so I'm big on learning at all ages. My, the two courses that I taught at Georgia Tech that I will go into in some detail, well, actually, I won't talk that much about the details of the courses, but, but about how real world learning was implemented there, were uh, Introduction to Neuroscience, which is mostly a lecture course, and Neuroengineering Fundamentals, which was mostly a lab course, although it did have a lecture component as well. And a good way to think about those two courses is that the neuroscience course is, is the biology of the brain and the neuroengineering course is taking that and applying it to do uh, useful things and to, and to uh, do research to help understand how the brain works and how it changes. Uh, interestingly, and you know, it's somewhat irrelevant, but I think it's uh, fun to think about the fact that my research was involved in learning uh, at the cellular and network level. So we were actually trying to study in my lab, how do networks of neurons grow and connect and learn um, at, a, at the sort of microscopic level. So first about the neuroengineering fundamentals course, this was a uh, usually had anywhere from a dozen to 20 students in it. These were usually seniors in um, biomedical engineering. And their goal was to make this course in one semester be a microcosm for what grad school might be like. I was hoping that everybody would go to grad school and become neuroscience and neuroengineering researchers. 
So we tried to jam a lot into one semester there. And what they'd spent most of their time on were projects. So the students had to research the literature, the scientific literature, come up with a real a uh, semester long project that they could do with the equipment that we provided them and that in this case it was multi electrode arrays with uh, brain cells growing in petri dishes connected to the uh, computers and the electronic instruments with lots of wires so here's a pic few pictures of students in that class uh, excited about what they're doing uh, you, most of the time not paying any attention to the fact that I'm wandering around the classroom taking photographs and they're like oh <laughs> you're taking pictures while I'm uh, and we were wearing masks way before it was cool uh, so there's a lot of sterile technique that you have to do in these classes so other uh, aspects that sort of brought the real world into this class were that I used a lot of guest lectures. Uh, lecturers would come in from around Atlanta and in some cases from far away. My friend Michael Korost flew across the country to talk about his experience with cochlear implants. So he's completely deaf until he got cochlear implants and now he can hear and communicate just fine with people using his voice and his artificial ears. This is one of the first, and in, in my opinion, one of the most transforming benefits that neuroengineering has given humanity. Uh, and I presume that we will give uh, many more such benefits, but to make the deaf hear is, is quite remarkable if you think about it. And that only happened in the last 20 years or so. So my students also had to um, plan and execute a group project. Well, this was their, their big experiment, uh, usually in groups of about four students or so. And these projects had a lot of iterations, a lot of failures, and, and there was a lot of class discussion in which we talked about these failures and made plans on how to improve things that didn't go right. The students were expected to design and build any equipment that we didn't already have, and they did a lot of that, and they wrote their own software, they analyzed a lot of data. When you're recording from brain cells with multi-electrode arrays, you can, you can overwhelm yourself with data very quickly. So doing data analysis was a big part of the, of the job there. I think one of the most highly motivating features of this class was that they were producing potentially publishable research projects. Um, and you know, they, it, it, it was unlikely that they're going to actually publish a paper on it in one semester, but it could happen. And that was a good motivator. They were, they were going to actually push forward uh, what was known about the brain and, and neuroengineering. They also gave useful feedback to manufacturers of the equipment that we were using. For example, by Axion Biosystems asked us to, uh, to let them know how the equipment worked and, and they gave us some equipment at a very reduced price for that deal. Uh, they also did some prototyping for a company called Backyard Brains that makes really cool kits for um, recording your brain waves and doing other fun things with your body physiology. So uh, they got to help design the equipment that is now commercially being sold by that company. We also went on some field trips that were a lot of fun. They uh, went to the Center for Ad Advanced Brain Imaging to do fMRI experiments. Um, here is one of my students in the fMRI machine about to get her brain scanned. And she's not, you know, most people that go into those machines are in trepidation because they might have a brain tumor. She's excited about this because she's going to learn something about what's going on in her head in an experiment that she designed. Another student is here wearing his EEG rig uh, to do some experiment on his brain waves in Melody Moore Jackson's lab. So they had some field trips that uh, if they went well, could make the leaders of those labs uh, sit up and listen and go, wow, we should do some of these experiments that uh, Potter's students came up with. These are really good experiments. So one of the really important goals for this course was how to learn from failure. You know, they're, do, they're doing self-designed experiments. It's very likely that things wouldn't go perfectly. And in fact, I would say almost all of the experiments failed in some ways or another. So they were very understandably concerned about their grades. They were used to being graded on how well things went in class. In this case, when things didn't go well, they got very worried that it was gonna be uh, ruining their grades. And I had to keep reminding them that they were graded on how much effort and how much learning their lab notebooks reflected, regardless of whether the projects or experiments worked. Um, and those notebooks, which were very important, uh, were 
actually put into our department library and used by later students uh, as reference material so that they wouldn't make the same mistakes. So that was uh, an important motivator for them to do a good job writing up their experiments, making them readable, and uh, pointing out the things that didn't go right. So you can see on the left some of the gadgets that my students made in the lab to do their research, electronic circuits and actual mechanical devices for probing and prodding the neurons. Now I'm going to move from making physical objects in a lab class to making enduring digital objects or digital artifacts on the web. So this was done in my introductory neuroscience class, also called BMED or Biology 4752. This was a much bigger class, 60 to 100, uh, usually seniors in biology and biomedical engineering. It was a very difficult class. Uh, it was an elective, and I told the students on the first day, um, this is not a cakewalk. Don't, if you're planning on getting an elective here that will be easy, then you're in the wrong place. And um, I got feedback at the end of the semester from the students. It was anonymous feedback that they were strongly encouraged to write. And I, I, I got some printouts of, of my um, feedbacks here, and I just had a quick look at them to see what some of my students said. This is a lot of the reason why <clears throat> I could tell that they were very engaged. So here's one who says, very interactive and engaging. Students get as much as they put into this course, and Dr. Potter does a great job making students want to get as much out of the course as they can. Another student said, I have spent more time in this class than in any other classes, but it's worth the effort. <laughs> so I love comments like that, you know, because this is an elective course. They did not have to take it. They took it voluntarily, uh, and yet, and it was really hard, and yet they, um, they all did really well. I was always continually, repeatedly surprised. I should have gotten used to it, but I was repeatedly surprised at how well my students did in terms of accomplishing the goals that I set out for them. So one of the very difficult goals was to do this semester-long assignment of becoming an expert in a chosen neuroscience topic that's not yet on Wikipedia. And they had to then write a real Wikipedia article about it. So this is not a toy project. They actually had to create a real article. And when I started this assignment back in 2006, Wikipedia was not nearly as well established as it is now. And in fact, most academics thought that it was... Um, not reliable and they just discounted it and prevented their students from referring to it in their papers and whatnot. And um, since then, obviously things have changed. Wikipedia has become much more believable and reliable. And in large part, that's thanks to my students. They've added over 250 new neuroscience articles for Wikipedia and expanded many of the stubs. Stubs are small articles that, um, that are marked for needing expansion. The fact that this was a real world project was a really fantastic motivator for the students, as you'll see in a minute um, with some, some uh, testimonials. There were many sub assignments that helped the students build the expertise that they needed to write a good article. Most students started the semester knowing very little or anything about the neuroscience topic that they chose and they had to become an expert in it. And that was quite scary and daunting for them. And they didn't think they could do it until they went through quite a, a few of these sub assignments, like for example, uh, reading lots of papers, of course, and, and occasionally books, uh, but also interviewing experts on the topic that they had chosen. There was a volunteer community. There is a volunteer community of Wikipedia editors, and they are very helpful for my students. When they're writing their articles, uh, they could ask them questions when they were stuck on something about how to work Wikipedia behind the scenes there. And as a teacher, I found it extremely helpful to use this Wikipedia education program that the Wikimedia organization has created. Uh, it actually didn't exist when I started this. So for the first, I would say, three years that we did this, I was groping around in the dark as much as my students were. Subsequently, the Wikipedia education program created something called the Wikipedia ambassadors. And uh, I asked my librarians if they would become Wikipedia ambassadors, and they agreed instantly to do that. And what they do is they learn the, the nuts and bolts of how to do Wikipedia editing. And the ambassadors then uh, taught this to my students. So before they really got involved in, in actually editing their articles, they would go to the library for a session in front of the Wikipedia ambassadors on how to actually edit Wikipedia. 
And that was extremely helpful and really sped up the process and, and took a lot of the burden off me showing them how to do it because I really didn't know how to do it very well at all. So I, for several years, I polled my alumni a few years after they graduated and asked them, first of all, do you even remember this course that we uh, had together? And second of all, did the real world aspects of it make any difference for you? Or, or was there anything memorable about it? And uh, one of the alumni, uh, Krista Caesar, said, intro to neuroscience was completely different from all my other courses because of its real world approach. This approach made the material relevant, interesting, and useful at the same time, therefore making learning a fun process. In addition to learning some great neuroscience, I also picked up on some very practical skills that I value greatly today, such as creating a Wikipedia article, directing, recording, and uploading a YouTube video, interviewing an expert in a neuroscience subtopic, and writing writing an Amazon review article on a book out in the market. I never did any of this in any other course, and this made Intro to Neuroscience extremely refreshing and novel. So I won't read this whole one from Mike Weiler to you, but I just wanted to point out, he says, the assignments motivated me to become engaged in the topic and do an excellent job because I wanted to represent myself well. So for better or for worse, peer pressure is a fantastic motivator. And for them to know that the whole world and, and their fellow students are uh, watching them and judging them uh, really motivated my students to do a good job on their Wikipedia articles. These slides will be made available to you, so afterwards you can read the details here if you want, and also I might have some hyperlinks that you can click on in this slideshow. So some other real world aspects of the introductory neuroscience class. Uh, again, we had a lot of guest lecturers who came and talked about their lab research. I made sure that they weren't just giving their introductory lecture, that they were really talking about what was their lab doing right now at the cutting edge of neuroscience so they could learn what research was really like. They were asked to find a book of their own choice that had something to do with neuroscience and read it and then write a detailed review on Amazon using their real name. They also read and ranked other students' book reviews. So this was kind of like the way that we review each other's grants. As scientists, there's a lot of peer review of, um, of grant applications that goes on. And I structured this assignment for them to rank each other's book reviews a lot like we rank each other's grant reviews. And I'll give you a case study here. Jennifer Carlson, one of my students, read the book called Rewire Your Brain by somebody named Arden. And uh, I went on Amazon the other day to look at how this uh, book review is doing and seven people commented on it and they said things like, excellent review of this book, thanks so much, extremely comprehensive review, write more reviews please, Jennifer. I don't know if she did or not, but I hope she did. Uh, this was the most impressive thing. Years later, I mean, this was probably eight years ago that she wrote this, 335 people found this helpful and it remains the most helpful review of this book. So she really is making a difference, uh, certainly for the author of this book and for all the people that are deciding whether or not to read it or not. So my students uh, attended, also attended and wrote up lectures from around Atlanta, and they also went to the Society for Neuroscience Conference. It, it happened to be in Atlanta one year, and I managed to find funding to send my students, however many of them wanted to go to the conference, they could go. Um, as I mentioned before, they interviewed an expert orally and presented what they learned to the class, but this might be an expert in the topic they had chosen for their Wikipedia article. And so in that case, the expert would help them actually write their article. This also taught them skills like how to arrange uh, an interview with somebody who's usually very busy and might not be terribly interested in uh, giving an interview. So they have to figure out how to convince them that it's worth it for the uh, interviewee. Look, I'm going to make a Wikipedia article about you. I think that would be worth it. Um, my students got extra credit for a variety of different things. And this was actually an idea that the students themselves came up with. They said, can we go for a, uh, a walk to defeat Alzheimer's or to defeat uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. So they went for walks and at these benefit walks, they would raise money and they would also visit the booths where they had set up lots of information where the students could learn about these diseases. They could also earn extra credit by making YouTube videos as Krista Caesar alluded to there. And um, 
One of my students was very good at impersonating Scooby-Doo and Shaggy and a bunch of other computer, a bunch of other cartoon characters. And he wrote uh, uh, a YouTube video. He created and produced a YouTube video called Kermit and Friends Explain the Basal Ganglia. His name is Austin Bennett. And I think that was probably the best contribution of all the videos I saw. You can find that video on my website. YouTube took it down for copyright problems. But I've, I asked him if I could put it on my own website. And he said he would be happy to do that. So. So you can find it there and learn something about the basal ganglia, which is part of your brain that helps you get up and do stuff. Uh, if, you're, if you're having a hard time being motivated, for example, if you have Parkinson's disease, you have a problem with the basal ganglia. So ask yourself, if your students make stuff, uh, is it just going on the shelf or are they just taking it home and throwing it away? Um, that's, that's the wrong way to do things. They should be working with real world clients and customers. Somebody should care about what they're making. Design modeling and problem solving in the classroom are important, uh, but they have much less impact if they're just toy problems or cookbook lessons that you designed or that some previous teacher designed for them to just follow the um, cookbook and, and come up with a project. If it's something that they had help designing, as, as Dale talked about, um, and uh, Andrew talked about getting, giving them the agency is really important um, that they, if they had their hand in the design process, making their own cookbook, it really motivates them. So how can you do that? You ought to get your students involved in a maker fair. Any age of student can get involved in maker fairs. They can, they can have their own booths there, or they can just help um, with somebody else's booth. I did this myself in 2012 when the Atlanta Mini Maker Fair actually took place at Georgia Tech campus. I presented some of the things that I've made and I was just blown away by the enthusiasm of everyone there. And in fact, that was really the turning point of my life, changed my career because it made me realize these are my people. This is who I want to spend time with. Uh, it made me decide to go on this maker movement sabbatical for the next year. 2014. And then in fact, I had such a good time, I continued it for another year, and then decided at the end of two years of sabbatical in the maker movement, this is what I want to do for my uh, for the rest of my life. You can also have your students create Instructables. Instructables is a website where they can have how to videos and, and written descriptions that help you make stuff. And uh, pretty much any sort of thing you can find on Instructables that you can make. Um, and it's a really good way to learn how to make things. And it's great for your students to post because it's a friendly community. It's free and um, very positive. And it's a good way for them to build their portfolio. So at the maker fairs, I was always blown away at these learn to solder booths, which were created um, by Mitch Altman. And I have to give great thanks to Dale Doherty for creating the maker fair itself and, um, and to Mitch Altman for coming up with the idea of let's have a learn to solder booth, even though there, there's kids holding on to a, a soldering iron, which could burn them or poke their eyes out. They trusted that these kids would do the right thing, and they did. They all made little blinky things that they could take home and um, somehow advance their skills. And the thing that blew me away was just how long the lines were always. They were always long lines for these booths. So there's such an untapped uh, yearning in students of all ages, not just kids, but grownups too, um, to get involved with making, uh, doing electronics or whatever it might be. And I think that um, this needs to be, this untapped need needs to be tapped into in cl the classroom, not just at maker fairs. Um, let's see here. Okay, so making it real. Encourage group efforts that help others. Have your students work together in small groups and ask them, how do you think you can make this go out into the real world and improve the world? Have the students share what they make with the world in some way. Most of these complex projects will require a lot of iteration. They're gonna have a lot of failure and you can get external people from the outside world to help with that. So they can give advice and help to set the students back on track again. Have them consult experts. Um, keep the project results online after the class is over. Students can use that to help build their portfolios and use that to help them get into a, a good college or, or impress their future employers. 
And I think it's really helpful to have the students evaluate each other. And also, to, as I mentioned before, to have the big wide world evaluate them. That gives them a lot of extra motivation and helps make it real. So I already mentioned the importance of agency. When students uh, do these projects, they acquire a deep sense of agency by tackling real world problems. Uh, they no longer fear failure. If they've done it a few times and failed, they know they can recover from failure and they don't mind having to learn new things to get the job done. I love this quote from Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So real world projects are highly motivating for students and they prepare them for jobs in the real world. Student projects should be visible to the whole world and enduring. And about teachers, if you have a class full of motivated students, it's very hard for the teacher not to get motivated as well. So I think that's that kind of uh, answers the question that a lot of teachers have. Why would I do this? This is so much more work. Uh, in the you know, in reality, I didn't find that it was much more work. It just means that you um, you get extra motivation and you're willing to do what it takes to make these project based classes work. So I had great success implementing these real world assignments and you can too. I have a lot of very specific details in my book. <clears throat> uh, a few of the take home messages I covered are circled in purple there. Um, a lot of the ones that I did not cover are also mentioned in the book here. I want to emphasize this one at the bottom that I, th I really strongly believe that every single student is smart in some ways. Even your worst students, not just the C students, but the F students have some special skills that can be brought out by giving them the right kind of project or even better, letting them come up with the right kind of project themselves. Obviously, they're going to need a lot of hand holding and help. Uh, their uh, fellow students can help them with that and you can too. If you want to learn more about some of these things, uh, obviously look at the book, uh, but you can go to my website. I have a research website, which also has a teaching page, potterlab.gattech.edu, and also my maker workshops that I'm teaching in Ireland are at stevempotter.tech. If you have any questions or if you want to give me any feedback on this material or anything related, feel free to e email me. My email is stevepwork at gmail.com. Okay, it looks like uh, we're just about on time. We maybe have a couple of minutes for questions. If anybody has one, you can type it into the chat window. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Um, there is a question of a link, a link to the 250 new newer articles, or do you have a sample outline with criteria of how you assigned uh, that writing for a middle school teacher who would like to modify it for young students? Yes. For, so the Wikimedia uh, Foundation that, um, let's see if I can go back slides here. Yeah, uh, they have very specific advice. And, and the way you do it is you look for tags that have been put on articles that say this article needs improving. So for middle, middle school students, it's probably a good idea to, um, to just begin with editing the articles rather than creating articles from scratch. So, so if you have the slides for this, uh, if you collect the slides after this presentation is over and you click on this, it will take you right there or you can just Google Wikimedia education program. Um, if you go to my website, there's a link to the, some of the articles that on Wikipedia that my students created those 250 new neuro articles. If you go to my teaching page and that's at potterlab.gattech.edu. Okay. Thank you, other, Steve. Any other um, questions? I don't see any in there. Um, let me just remind people that uh, you need to sign into the next session in this uh, track. It's introducing AI robotics using NVIDIA's Jetson with Asir Arans. Um, and I want to thank Steve uh, for sharing your, your ideas, your work, and uh, all that you're doing. Um, Good. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dale. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'll look forward to the rest of this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.